The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of Your Included, theologian Dr. Paul Lewis Metzger talks about the need for the church to include all peoples. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fizell. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to be here, Mike. Thanks. Uh, in your book, Consuming Jesus, you have an afterword by John M. Perkins, and you're, you have a strategic ministry partnership with him. And uh, in the book, you quote him, uh, in, the, in the beginning of the book especially, uh, some extensive quotes, and one is, we have substituted a gospel of church growth for a gospel of reconciliation. Tell us about that. Well, I think what Dr. Perkins is getting at there is that our emphasis is so often on quantitative growth, and while there is a place for that, I mean, the early church, 5,000 right off the bat, and the like, but we've taken the focus off of qualitative growth and discipleship and have put our focus on the quantitative growth dimension. And so he says, we've replaced the gospel of church growth, or sorry, gospel of reconciliation with the gospel of church growth. And so, uh, you know, he's really calling for a more holistic spirituality and a church that really gets beyond issues of race and ethnic division and the like, and that's the context for that particular statement. And he also says in that same context that the American Evangelical Church is the most racist institution in America, and I know that at least one blogger raised real question over that statement in analyzing the book and really misunderstood what Perkins, I believe, was after. He's not saying that evangelicals are the most racist individuals, but institutionally, we're often blind because of our emphasis on individual people. We often don't account for the structural dimensions. And even in church growth, we structure religion and spirituality by way of, as what I've said elsewhere, uh, along the lines of this homogeneous unit principle of working with people, targeting people of a certain uh, sociological, uh, social, economic bent, if you will, a certain uh, demographic. And that's not expansive enough. We need to take into account people's whole stories, their context, and I'm for, for what it's worth, focus on language and location, but not likings. So to work by way of preferences, gives rise to separating people in America today along consumer lines, and that often tracks with separation by way of ethnicity and economics and uh, other related matters. So that's what I think Perkins is after when he says that, and we don't know, and this is something I would add here, we really have no idea, at least by and large in the evangelical movement, about a prophetic voice of what Dr. Perkins is really calling for. We know how to make a profit, as in P-R-O-F-I-T, and we write books on how to grow your church and make a profit in religion, but we really know very little about prophetic voices, uh, such as what Perkins offers. And uh, we need to really re-engage Scripture in terms of its call to a holistic spirituality. So what you're talking about is the fact that uh, most evangelical churches are going to be, uh, have white faces, uh, predominantly, and and be more of a middle to upper middle class uh, constituency as opposed to uh, reflecting um, the whole culture. And you're, you're proposing certain ways to, um, to address that. How do, you, mm -hmm. um, how do you suggest churches uh, begin to look at things and how, what should they do differently? Well, if I could just uh, step back for a second and, and make the point that I think that's where we've been as a movement. If we're going to have growth, we need to be concerned for diversity, not in some kind of politically correct manner, because uh, that's where a lot of people will raise questions. Is this just trying to be PC, uh, fit in with American culture? That's not it at all. It's, you know, are we really missional in our orientation? Do we really have our eyes open? Are we really reaching out to the communities around us? And America is not becoming increasingly white. America's becoming increasingly brown, if you will. And I don't look at that as a threat. I look at it as a great opportunity. And where the growth is going to come, I think, by and large, in the years ahead, will be in non-Caucasian contexts. 
And so that's already happening in certain contexts, but the dominant evangelical superstructures uh, are not there. They're not in that way. Our leadership in our institutions of uh, churches and education and parachurch, I would still say are largely white. And I happen to be a white person. I'll often joke with people when I'm speaking to them. Remember, I'm a white guy. I'm not you know, out here to attack white people, but we need to be missional. We need to open our eyes. And so I do think we need to be concerned for doing church, as I said earlier, based on language and location, not likings. And if we have eyes to see, we'll see that there's more diversity in our communities than we've often been able to or willing to acknowledge. It's there, but are we really being intentional about looking to see how diverse our communities really are? So that is what I would want to maintain in addition to other principles, even on how we do theology, what we preach on, how central is the Lord's Supper uh, in our worship services, not as a placebo tablet uh, with the supper, but more by way of, it's not simply about individuals before God, it's about persons in communion with God and with one another. And the Lord's Supper in Corinth was meant to break down class divisions. And yet the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 11, was dividing people, even at the agape feast, by way of class. And Paul says, not on my watch, that won't happen here because it is the Lord's table where all are equal, all are welcome. And we need to make sure that all people are welcome to the bountiful harvest of God's communion. Now, if even if all people are welcome at a given church, um, wouldn't it still work out in general because of the way people are that uh, that churches still build up around uh, racial and ethnic um, uh, similarities as opposed to, uh, don't, don't most people feel more comfortable uh, worshiping together with others who share their, uh, their cultural and ethnic uh, background and history? Well, surely people feel more comfortable with that orientation or with that framework, but that doesn't mean it's most biblical. And that's what the Corinthians were doing. They were doing things based on comfortability. And so uh, the rich were in their dining rooms in the house church eating with themselves because that was the Greco-Roman culture. It allowed for that. Mm -hmm. And the poor Christians, poor Christians were without. They were not able to have anything of the feast. They were, so to speak, in the courtyard with their faces plastered to the glass looking in. And Paul said, that's not going to happen. Even though that's your comfort zone, that's not going to happen in God's ta uh, at God's table. And so we need to replace comfortability with the comfort of the cross. And all are equal there. And that might sound really pious and uh, super spiritual, but I don't mean it that way. It's a matter of, do we really have a heart for seeing the church look like what the kingdom of God will be? And in a, another book that just came out, Exploring Ecclesiology, my co-author and I talk about we need to live now in light of what will be. And as a friend of mine has said elsewhere, uh, if the kingdom of God is not divided, how on earth can the church be? So we need to live now in light of what will be in God's eschatological kingdom before the throne. Uh, and so as that kingdom community now, we need to look different because scripture calls us to be that. It's not to beat ourselves over the head if there are no people of different colors in our community and we don't have to bust people in from hundreds of miles away. That's not the point, but are we truly tr seeking to be missional? So I want to get beyond what I like and my preferences. Uh, with worship services, this is a lot of where the generational divisions uh, occur. And I don't necessarily like a lot of the worship per se in churches with the praise choruses and the like. I like a lot of hymns. I, I like liturgy, but I'd rather put down my own preferences for the sake of worshiping with people uh, of different generations. Like So we have the generational gap, the worship wars and generational divisions, and I think that's going to hurt us long term. It's already hurting us long term where young people don't feel connected to churches and they leave churches for their own type of church later. We need to worship as a family. So I'm very concerned about all these services, contemporary, traditional, is bound up with the same kind of consumer preference. And it's subtle but it ends up with very uh, destructive tendencies in the long haul. So that's, that's well, what, how I would What respond. is a way around that, though? Um, because in a, in a given church, um, even, even in, a, in a, you take a black church or a Korean church, mm -hmm. 
uh, typically a white person is not going to feel comfortable there. Um, likewise, a, a, a typical Korean worshiper is not going to feel comfortable in a white church or a black church. They're going to prefer to go to a, to a Korean church. And, and in that context, you've got rich people, young people, you've got age, ages or generations as well as uh, socio, uh, socioeconomic levels. Mm -hmm. There can be an effort to, um, to make all, all of everyone in the generations and the rich and poor welcome in that context. But how do you go about um, and, and what, what procedures or what, how do you, sure. it's one thing to be welcoming, but is it, will it really happen where there is a, uh, where churches begin to become missional to the degree that uh, all races can mm -hmm. uh, enjoy and meet together as one body? How, will that ever become a, a reality? Well, I think it's a very long process and it's a hard road. It's very painful uh, because those wounds are still deep and a lot of people think they've gone away on the racial tensions, for example, but it's often from people who haven't even engaged in the issues, haven't asked the questions, haven't come alongside of others from different backgrounds and really started to ask questions and live life together. Uh, and if we do, we'd see that these things are uh, real issues and open wounds in many contexts. It depends case by case, but it, they are there. They are very much present in American culture. And, you know, as I said before, language and location, not likings. So you could have an immigrant community from Africa, per se, or somewhere else in the world where they're speaking in their native language, um, first generation. I'm thinking, okay, second generation, third generation. And are they still seeking to be set apart? And often at that point, it simply becomes a matter of cultural preference. I'm not trying to do away with cultural distinctiveness. I'd love and long for church context where we celebrate the diversity of our worship styles and like. And we need to be intentional. It's one thing to say we're welcoming. Uh, anyone can say that. I never talk about that we just want to welcome people. I want to be intentional about making sure that they really do have a place at the table and uh, that they have ownership. And so how do I change structures, even leadership structure, where if I'm a pers person in a position of authority, how do I use my gifting, my, my influence, my position to make it possible with people, for people of, of other gifting uh, experiences like, for them to actually have ownership and leadership. Uh, in some ways, it's a, it's a death to myself. And I, I feel that when the issue comes back to making people feel comfortable, we're just going to nurture that same problematic orientation. I do not believe in making people feel comfortable in church. I want to know, have people know that they're loved and cared for and like, but not comfortable, as in making sure they feel that all their desires and wants are met. And again, that's the consumer problem. It's giving people what they want, when they want it, at the least cost to themselves. That's the consumer problem in the church. And so again, if you deal with these issues of ethnic division and economic division and generational division, and that doesn't whet their appetite, they'll go next door. And that's very problematic. So how do we change the preaching? How do we change the ideology, the mentality, the, the, uh, the spirit uh, of our churches where we're just catering to people because we want to make sure people come in the door. And again, I don't mean it by way of a kind of false piety or it sounds all good. To me, this is DNA and it's in part because this is my own life. My wife's from Japan. Uh, she's a Japanese national, a Japanese citizen. Our, our kids are dual citizens. I have to hear what my son experiences at school and what my daughter will experience and what my wife's experience. Going into an immigration office to get her a green card years ago, and I talk about it in the book, Consuming Jesus, it wasn't as sexy or as funny as Hollywood's green card version. It was a very painful experience. And I felt like a helpless hopeful, just like the Mexican uh, applicants looking for green cards and citizenship papers. I felt on the outside looking in with some of the things we had to endure. And I saw another side of America, as much as I love our country. I saw another side. And a lot of people experience that in the church. And we want people to feel welcome? Absolutely. As long as everyone feels welcome. But that doesn't mean comfortable. 
uh, because Jesus calls us to carry a cross so that we die, so that we can truly live and find a truly meaningful life that's beyond our best life now. Now, it sounds like there has to be a, a, a passion. Um, in, in other words, I don't see that happening unless there's a passion in the pastor to preach and educate the church um, in a way that helps it to see itself in a new light, a fresh light, as opposed to just being a church to attend uh, for the various social reasons that, that oftentimes we attend church for the friendships and the security and the sense of support and so on, but um, to, to, for the church to see itself differently. Mm -hmm. I would think it's partly the pastor's role, but just like the President of the United States, the President of the United States isn't fully in control. There are a lot of other people who have right. uh, ownership of the issue. So the pastor is certainly a major player, elders or church council, the lay people. I mean, there's a sense in which we all need to be in a state of desperation. Uh, you know, Perkins says we've replaced this gospel of reconciliation with the gospel of church growth. That's not good news. And a watching world looks on us, and it's not like we're trying to tickle the ears. It's not like we're, if we just do the race issue right, then the world will like us. I don't believe that, but I think they see the hypocrisy when we talk about, you know, the love of God in Christ and all people are welcome, and yet Martin Luther King Jr.'s statement from way back in the 50s or 60s is still true today. The most segregated hour in Christian America, or even in a post-Christian America, is Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Uh, and how can that be in God's household? So for me, we have to have a sense of urgency and desperation. And that's, that doesn't come overnight for a lot of people. It, it, it would be wonderful if the Holy Spirit would just move in such a way that people would be awakened to it. And sometimes the Spirit does work in that way. Other times it's long haul. And I've been in church situations most of my life, even talking to these things, where the dominant structures aren't thinking about moving toward change anytime soon. And it's a marathon race. It's not a short-term sprint. And if I didn't have this confidence and hope that Jesus will make this reality uh, of the, a church that's truly united in his eschatological kingdom, uh, I'd give up hope and I'd despair because it is so painful, it is so slow going. So I think there has to be that sense of urgency and desperation that our lives must create the space for our views to be heard. And when we have a segregated church, economically, ethnically, and in other ways, what are we saying to the world? Are we really salt and light? I don't think so. And so I don't say it from the standpoint of wanting to put a guilt trip on people and be moralistic. It's a longing for something more noble, more profound, a Christianity that really gets at the heart of God. That's what I long for. It's, I, I, I've seen what it can be like. I've been in situations where it's more beautiful and more profound, and I just long for us to look like what God calls us to be as his church. In John 17, may they be one as we are one, Father, that the world might know that you have sent your Son. So we're telling the watching world that God hasn't sent his Son if we're not truly one. And that's not just ethnically, economically, it's not just generationally, it's in a host of ways in which we don't have unity. The turf battles we have in churches and beyond, the denominational warfare and the like, turf, and it's often ego related. And Paul challenged that uh, completely head on in 1 Corinthians. I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and they weren't of Christ. And so the ego problem is usually the biggest problem, as, along with in American culture today, the comfort zone problem. So those things need to be dealt with prophetically and compassionately, calling people to something more beautiful and noble. Because if it's guilt trip, that just, that doesn't help anyone. It's, it's helping people to repent, but to repent so that we enter into something more profound together. And I'm part of the problem. I want to be a part of the solution. I know a lot about these things. The question is, what am I doing about them? And I have to live them out all the more fully. And yet, and yet Paul wrote that 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And here we are 2,000 years later, and we still have the same problem. Mm -hmm. In your book, you propose a few uh, concrete suggestions about moving from here to there. Can you talk about those? Well, uh, in various contexts, you know, I'll talk about the kind of preaching that needs to occur, and I'd already mentioned that aspect of prophetic speaking and the kind of theology we're teaching. You know, what kind of theology do we foster? And Trinitarian theology is communal, it's relational, it's not individualistic. And so there are many practical principles that the book sets forth from different angles, some theological, some uh, in terms of worship, you know, how we do the Lord's Supper, 
uh, how we view the Lord's Supper. Uh, also, as it relates to community development work, we mentioned Dr. John M. Perkins before, and even how we engage as the church in the broader community. And he's talked at length about principles of relocation, reconciliation, and redistribution. And perhaps we'll have time to talk about those things. And it's bound up with our own partnership that he and I have developed. And third, there's a network called the Mosaics Global Network, which is helping churches move toward being more multi-ethnic. So there are a lot of things that can be done, developed, uh, different models for how to be integrating. Even how we do, and this is beyond the book, but how do we greet people? You know, what does our, our literature indicate? What does it suggest? And again, how do we do worship? Uh, who are we targeting? And I, I don't like the word targeting because it's, it's too narrow in its orientation. I want to be missional, but so often targeting is I'm going to focus on this niche group. And again, our whole community should be who we're seeking to minister to. Jesus' band of disciples was diverse, even though it was Jewish men, it's pretty diverse. I mean, Jesus always had to have his sleeping bag in between Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector every night because tax collectors were hated by zealots. And, you know, if given the chance, who knows what Simon the Zealot would have done to Matthew the tax collector. Paul rebuked Peter for not associating with the Gentiles, and he talks about it in Galatians. So, I mean, the early church, James, talks about the economic, the, the what we would call class divisions today with uh, the leaders giving preference to the rich and despising the poor. Uh, who's made up of our boards? Who, who, who makes up the boards of our churches? And like, Is it the power brokering uh, of the world that we have, or is it the cruciform existence of the cross of not many of us who were called to Christ were great or noble by way of the world's standards? Where is greatness to be found? And so I think a theological, a spiritual, a missional perspective that it's all encompassing. It takes years to develop, it takes a lifetime to live out, uh, and it is costly, but it's more profound, I think, in terms of what God is calling us to. How did you come to meet uh, John Perkins? Uh, back in around 2000, a friend of mine uh, said to me, we needed to get John Perkins to come to Portland to speak at Multnomah, where I teach, and uh, I direct this institute on the theology of culture, New Wine, New Wineskins, so we set it up so that Dr. Perkins, we invited him and he accepted, and uh, he came to Portland uh, to speak for this New Wine, New Wineskins conference on justice issues. And one of the places he spoke at was Reed College. And Reed has uh, talked about every year in the Princeton Review as being one of the most godless or non-religious, secular, uh, irreligious schools in America, depending on how you want to word it. Uh, it's not seen as a bastion of evangelical orthodoxy, to say the least. And yet the Reed's students wanted to hear this evangelical social justice advocate, civil rights leader from the Deep South, John M. Perkins, which struck me when he spoke there, he just shared his testimony, but it was radical. And it was transformational to me. I felt as a Multnomah Biblical Seminary professor, I had come to Christ in Reed College's auditorium, hearing Perkins share his story about how he was led to Christ, how God called him back to the Deep South to give his life for the poor. And then after he was nearly beaten to death, God called him beyond bitterness to be broken in holy love for even his oppressors. And God called him through that traumatic ordeal where he had a heart attack, uh, vital organs of his body were shredded. He said, God called me through that incident with these white police officers beating me to the point of death. God called me to race reconciliation for all people. And the Reed students stood up and gave him a standing ovation for a life so well lived. And while they might not have agreed with his evangelical convictions at that point, they knew there was something beyond uh, religion here that really was in an encounter with the living God through this man. And that, even now, just sends shivers down my spine because that is a more profound form of Christianity than I ever had experienced to that point. And I want my life, I want my family's lives, I want the Church of Jesus Christ in North America to enter in more fully into that kind of radical, sacrificial spirituality that's simply bearing witness to and participating in the life of the triune God revealed in Jesus Christ. And you, you are partnering with him in a um, uh, particular ministry, and, and how does that, how does that uh, contribute? Uh, back around the time of the release of the Consuming Jesus book, and this was after years of reflecting upon his story, theology, uh, my own family's story, you know, life in Portland and beyond, 
it's my own kind of manifesto, so to speak. Uh, when he read the material, and he had come back to Portland for another New Wine New Wineskins conference that was geared toward uh, the oppressed, the poor, ex-offenders. How do we relate compassionately uh, to them, the gospel, in a holistic manner? Dr. Perkins asked me if I would partner with him, and this is one of my mentors. This is uh, a man whom I have the highest regard for, and that he would ask me to partner with him is one of the greatest privileges in my whole life, having studied under Colin Gunton in London and then being able to work with this evangelical um, community development civil rights leader. It's a great marriage between Trinitarian theology and a life that really lives it out, illustrates that life and how to develop it. So he, he could sense that there was a theology I was developing by the grace of God that really resonated with what God had called him to do as a Bible teacher and as a practitioner for decades. As now he's in his late 70s and, and he's thinking about you know, the marathon race ahead and uh, the legacy, not in terms of an ego issue, but a stewardship. You know, how will these things be carried on for the long haul? And he's partnering with a variety of different people, and I'm one of them. And this partnership, Drum Majors for Love, Truth, and Justice, is bringing together uh, biblical theology of engagement that's wed to his profound practices of relocation, reconciliation, and redistribution. So we've spoken in different parts of the country, uh, and we're looking for other opportunities to go out and speak to really inspire people uh, to become themselves uh, members of the marching band. And the imagery comes from one of Martin Luther King Jr.'s messages where he wanted to be remembered as a drum major for justice. And again, love, love is the driving force of justice in the biblical framework. And uh, there's a need for justice when there's so much injustice in our world today and in America with all the greed that's bound up with the, the current economic mess and the, uh, the, the lack of concern for biblical truth. Um, love, truth, and justice, that as a catalytic force, and we simply want to bear witness to the triune God as he engages sacrificially through the church in our cultural context. So it's bringing together that biblical theology of engagement with what Perkins has been about, Dr. Perkins has been about with his community development work for decades. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.